Hey there, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the charts, using the power of technical analysis. You know, we were uh, talking earlier with Grayson Rose here at Stock Charts. We're looking at some stocks we may want to highlight for the month of December. Look for that special episode coming up uh, this Friday as we were sort of sketching things out. We talked a lot about the overbought conditions and the sort of relationship between the short-term overbought conditions and the longer-term structure, which is still actually quite positive. The seasonal tendencies, as we've mentioned in conversations with Jeff Hirsch and regularly on the show, seasonal tendencies pretty strong in November, played up very well. Strong in December as well. Now, we're also, I guess, on the other side of that, however, seeing defensive sectors like utilities pushed to the, up of the, uh, uh, the top of the list. Utilities, the number one S&P sector today, by the way. We're seeing uh, a lot of stocks, and not just the growthy leadership names, but other names like financial stocks, industrials, airlines, for example, all overbought recently after the run that they've had higher. So is this market due for a pause? What might that look like? And how can you sort of re relate the short-term uh, conditions with the longer-term structure? Hopefully we can touch on all of those things here on our show. We have a great guest today, by the way, uh, John Kosar of Asbury Research. He'll share how his Asbury 6 model has turned bullish. What sort of things he's looking for as the uh, market has had a pretty good run here into December. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and look at how things have actually played out. Before we look at the charts, doing a hit a poll question. We asked you recently, will Tesla be one of the top 10 largest S&P 500 companies two years from now? So this is a little bit of a more of a long-term question than we often ask. We're often asking about a month from now, three months from now, key level types of questions. Here we're asking you to think a little bit forward, right? What would that mean if Tesla becomes one of the largest S&P companies and remains in that sort of seat two years down the road, right? So then we're, we're going to the end of uh, 2025, if you can push that far forward. A lot of things, of course, can and probably will happen between now and, uh, now and then. Two-thirds of you, 63% said yes, you could see Tesla as one of the top 10 largest S&P companies. About a third of you said no. It's an interesting question when you think about Tesla because a couple different things would probably have to happen for that to be the case, for Tesla to be one of the largest names in the market uh, two years from now. Number one, the price is going to have to go up quite a bit further, and that's sort of one thing that we're not seeing here. And you look at the magnificent seven stocks, many of them have had really good runs. Charts like uh, you know Alphabet, for example, trying to break above resistance. Stocks like NVIDIA really stalling out at previous resistance and pulling back. Tesla is a bit of an outlier, and that's it's actually in a pretty consistent downtrend channel, right? If you look at the July peak, you could see a lower peak in September and in October and in November. And we can actually draw a trend channel that matches this uh, trend pretty well here. So we're going to start there. I'm kind of looking at the uh, highs. So I drew a trend line. You can hold the, whoops, you can, I hit the wrong button. You can hold the, whoops, hold on a second. So here we're going to draw a trend line and we get out of it. Now what we're going to do is draw, you know, I'm just going to draw another one. We're going to draw a secondary trend line down there below. There we go. And we'll do kind of a parallel channel. And now we can sort of see how the highs here, right? If we sort of look at the uh, trend channel on the top, lower highs, you can see the lows pretty parallel, right? It's sort of a parallel downtrend channel, lower highs, lower lows. And that's a sign of weakness, right? And so even though we've rallied in the month of November, we're rallying up to the trend line, right? The upper boundary of this pattern. Now, at some point, Tesla's going to break out of that trend line channel. That's what I, and I would probably put the trend line really exactly on the highs to uh, to validate that. But you're looking for Tesla to break out above uh, trend line resistance. We're not really seeing that at the moment, and we're not seeing it yet. So I think there's still more to prove, even before you think that there's the beginning of a recovery. Now, if you're looking two months out, it's not about this downtrend channel. It's about the bigger structure. So what you need to think about is Tesla would have to go up a lot, and other things would probably have to go up a lot less, right? Tesla would really have to outperform to outgain some of those mega cap growth stocks that are already up in there, the Apple's and Meta's and others. And if we want to talk about Tesla as a similar size to those, there's more to prove on the uh, on the upside for sure. Thanks for answering that poll question. So you don't miss the next one. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you follow us on all those socials and you'll definitely get the uh, next poll question. Let's keep going here with our market recap. As I mentioned, uh, actually a little bit of a down day. It's interesting that the market today opened higher, closed lower, which is not a look we've had actually too often recently. Uh, but uh, earlier in the day, most of the benchmarks uh, sort of in the, in the green, slightly to a, a little bit further. Through the course of the day, a little bit of distribution. You can see on the little preview chart, last couple hours of trading really rolled over quite a bit. So the S&P 500 finishing just below 4550, and that's down 0.4% 
from uh, yesterday's close. The Nasdaq Composite down 0.6%. Uh, the mid and small cap index is down slightly less than the S&P. So the S&P small cap uh, index down to 1,200. That's down 0.2%. The only green you see on this front page is the VIX, which is actually just trying to get right, right back above 13. But overall, the VIX down in the 12 range is pretty low, right? By long-term historical standards and certainly by short-term historical standards. So we're seeing a lower volatility uh, trend in the markets for sure. Interest rates overall continuing to come down. So we're seeing the bond markets, even though the S&P, the, the NASDAQ, uh, a lot of big uh, mega cap stocks have sort of stalled out, not really going much further than, uh, than the run in November. You're actually seeing continued strength in uh, the bond markets. One of our three and three charts yesterday, uh, by the way, was looking at the stock to bond ratio, finally favoring bonds for the first time in a long time, to be honest with you. It's been quite a few months since we've seen any sort of move like that. Overall, the trend's still favoring stocks over bonds, let's be clear, over the long term. But in the short term, you're really seeing bonds continue to strengthen. And what happened when bond prices are going higher, that means yields are coming down. So you see the 10-year yield is down almost to 4.1%, almost the same level uh, for the five-year point, the 30-year point, just a little bit above there, around 422. So 10-year yield, not too long ago, around 5%, now down almost to 4%. So that change in rates going uh, down quite a bit in a very short period of time is one of the things, one of the catalysts really uh, propelling stocks to have an incredibly strong November. Now the question is how much lower do rates really start to, uh, to go? We'll try to get to as many of these uh, charts as we can, by the way. So the TLT up about a third of a percent, dollar index up about a quarter of a percent from yesterday's close. Looking at the commodity space, a lot of red here. Besides gold, which was up about 0.4%, uh, everything else declining and crude oil really continuing to push to the downside. Uh, we talked yesterday with my guest, uh, Sam Burns of Mill Street Research about crude oil prices. The weakness that we've seen as I was scanning for stocks making new swing highs and lows earlier today, a lot of energy, energy by far the biggest uh, number of names on the new swing lows list. So the USO, a crude oil ETF down another 4% today, uh, today. natural gas prices down even more. Uh, silver, copper prices uh, down as well. So the DBC, which is a broader commodity ETF, down about 2.4%. Uh, uh, so besides gold up slightly, everything else uh, sort of in the uh, in the red. And that's a, that's a trend that's been, I think, manifesting for quite some time, certainly the weakness in crude oil. Cryptocurrency is a rare red day for Bitcoin and not much, down about 0.6%, still just below 44,000. It's been an incredible run to the upside. Um, one of the 10 stocks or what, 10 charts that will highlight on Friday's episode, Coinbase, which is currently the top-ranked stock in our uh, large-cap stock chart scooter rankings. Uh, Coinbase, of course, uh, profiting from the, uh, or certainly being pushed higher based on that strength. Expectations of further uh, strength in the crypto space, particularly Bitcoin, and to a lesser uh, degree, Ethereum. Both of those moving down slightly today. Ether around 2260 uh, here as we uh, go live with the show. Looking at sectors, a defensive sector right at the top of the list here. Utilities really outpacing everything else, up about 1.4%. After that, it was industrials, consumer discretionary, healthcare slightly positive. The other seven S&P sectors are actually down. Energy, the big loser today, down 1.6%, followed by technology down 0.8%. Uh, financials right after that, down about a half a percent. Financials, an interesting sector. has had such a run. A lot of those names overbought. We highlighted some of those regional banks and the runs that they've had earlier this week. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. If you're a fan of candle patterns, probably not super excited by the pattern we're seeing on the S&P because it's the dreaded bearish engulfing pattern. A bearish engulfing pattern is where you have an up day followed by a down day. Uh, looking at a candle chart just to get a little more detail here. The key is in the relationship of those two, uh, whoops, that's not it, the relationship between the two, um, the two candles. So the up candle and then the down candle, the down candle needs to engulf the body, right? The open to close range, which is sort of the body of the candle, needs to engulf uh, the body of uh, candle number one. And that's certainly what we've seen here at the S&P 500. So what's happened is we rallied up to 4,600. And if you think about what's happened in the last couple of weeks, right? November was a, a, a month of strength, but it was really the first three months of November when the big gains occurred. The end of November and now the first week in December, really more sideways, right? So we're right where we were. This is what, the middle of November? This is the end of the third, second, third week in November. We're kind of right at that same point. So we've chopped around a little bit, but this, this is a market that really has stalled out. And this is when we talk about the overbought conditions, talk about stocks that have had really good runs, and now maybe starting to pull back a little bit. I think that's what 
is uh, preventing the S&P from uh, pushing above 4,600. And I don't think you have to look much further than some of the Magnificent Seven stocks really have come off a little bit this week after, you know, again, an incredible run uh, last month. So this bearish engulfing pattern, as I would see it, really just suggests the next one to three bars more, li more likely lower than higher. And again, I think that makes a ton of sense when you have a market that had an aggressive run in uh, November. We are testing a key resistance level. Here's the S&P testing 4,600. A lot of other charts testing a lot of other important uh, resistance levels. Reasonable, you get a bit of a, of a pullback. This candle pattern today may suggest that uh, the drop is, uh, is imminent. You can see the RSI was overbought for the S&P, but now as the week progresses, the momentum is actually uh, lessening quite a bit. Uh, we have a great uh, guest today, again, John Kosar. We'll talk a little bit more about the S&P and some of the levels he's looking for. So I'll move on to some other things so we can uh, save that conversation uh, there. Well, one other uh, breadth indicator I wanted to highlight for you, maybe two, uh, the bullish percent indexes. Uh, you know, this week, the bullish percent index on the S&P 500 is pushing above 70. I haven't highlighted this in red yet, but I'll do it when I uh, have a moment to do so. If you look back to the left, the previous times when this indicator has gone above 70%, what that means is that seven out of every 10 S&P 500 stocks have registered a bull, bullish signal most recently on their point and figure chart. And when it gets to 70 plus percent, these are the red shaded areas, you'll note that getting to 70% is not the end of the world. That often uh, means we are getting to the sort of fourth quarter, the later innings of the, uh, of the run. Often you can move higher a little bit, but the real signal is when we come back below that 70% uh, reading. So now that we're sort of up, up into that uh, range, I'd be looking for a drop uh, below 70%, and that has usually been a pretty good indicator of a run that is now done and now a pullback phase. And then you start to look at, you know, what sort of pullback scenarios make sense, how low some of these uh, individual names could go and find support. And that might help you uh, make sense of the breadth conditions as we roll over. Uh, just a couple other charts here to finish off our market recap. Let's go to uh, crude oil again because you know, this continues to push to the downside. Our guest yesterday, uh, Sam Burns, we were talking in a little more detail about uh, crude oil. Here's the USO. We looked at uh, w, uh, excuse me, dollar sign WTIC, which is WTI Cushing. That's the main U.S. Uh, equity benchmark. It's basically crude oil futures. Uh, Brent crude is a European benchmark that a lot of people will quote as well. They often move in similar ways, but sometimes there are some differences that uh, tell you a little bit about global uh, oil prices. Uh, but for now, I'll highlight the USO because this is an ETF that tracks uh, crude oil prices. So if you don't have access to like futures data, USO is a good proxy for just short-term movements for sure in crude oil. You can see we gapped lower on the USO. We're now down into the range of the lows that we experienced earlier in 2023. So while stocks sold off in September, October, and now have rallied back 100% of the way back to their highs from uh, the third quarter, you see the opposite for crude oil. Actually rallied July, August, September, October, now November, and now into December continue to push to the downside. We broke below uh, the, the bottom of a, what's called a symmetrical triangle pattern or a coil pattern. Uh, here at the end of October, we've really continued to push to the downside. We're now below the 200-day moving average. I'm looking at support down here to, uh, to the left, but a lot of energy stocks, I mean, facing support, facing the 200-day moving average, definitely failing to hold some of those levels. A uh, chart like uh, Halliburton comes to mind, breaking below the 200-day just today. So this is a stock that was up uh, around $43 a share in September and October. We're now down to almost $33 a share. Uh, this week, got to, uh, just below 35 today, closing below the 200-day moving average for the first time since uh, early July. And that's pretty common in the energy space. What, what strikes me on a chart like Halliburton is this is a stock that was testing pretty significant uh, resistance from 2022 and 2023. As we made a new high in October, look at how the momentum completely diverged, right? So higher prices, lower momentum. That's the bearish momentum divergence we've highlighted. Uh, usually suggests upside exhaustion and a bit of a downtrend coming. That's what we've seen. And, and, and while uh, oil could bottom at any point, some of these energy stocks could find support. I'm not seeing it uh, on, the charts, uh, on the charts just yet. You know, one of the areas is I'm thinking about stocks that have shown uh, sort of renewed strength coming into December. Home builders certainly come to mind. Now, you know, how can home builders rally? Basically, the ITB, which is one of the home builder uh, ETFs, retraced, uh, you know, from 90 down to 72. We're now round tripped back up to 90 and more today. We're actually pushing even higher to, uh, to push above $90 a share. So how does that happen? Well, lower interest rates, a big part of that, the 10-year yield again coming from, you know, 5% down to 4.1, 0.2%. That difference is a, pretty big, uh, is a pretty big change and, you know, sort of giving investors additional confidence that, 
uh, you know, homes, uh, that people will be willing to buy homes and there will be, uh, you know, it's a little more attractive environment to go and, uh, and take on a mortgage, whereas, you know, a couple months ago, it did not feel particularly good with rates pushing to the upside. Now that you feel rates coming down as bond prices go higher, home builders and even derivative names, right, something like a Home Depot, um, uh, you know, really having an incredible, uh, an incredible run. What's interesting on the chart of Home Depot, by the way, is if you think about it, this is the, the, uh, an example of a lot of names that were oversold in October, now overbought. So we've really completely changed the momentum characteristics from very weak uh, at the end of October to quite strong in early December. And again, my, the challenge that I have with thinking that this market is just going to keep going onward and ever upward is that things usually don't play out like that, right? When you had a big run, you usually need at least a pause to kind of reset things, right? Sort of give a higher low, which allows this uptrend to persist, give some new buyers that maybe miss that initial move an opportunity to get back in and uh, layer into the stock. That's what I'd be looking for on something like Home Depot as it's testing a monster resistance level right around 330. That was the high from August, also the high from earlier this year. We're kind of right back to that point. So, you know, if and when this gets above 330, that's a pretty impressive uh, breakout. Certainly on the weekly chart, right? If you go to the weekly chart, look at this basing pattern that we're talking about between around 270 on the lower end, around 330 on the upper end. We get a little bit further, and this feels like a big rotation, sort of a breakout of an established base, which I think uh, could be a compelling, uh, compelling move. In terms of other things, uh, getting, a, getting a nice bid to the upside, I think uh, worth highlighting. Airlines for sure. So here's Delta Airlines, again, similar to uh, Home Depot, oversold at the end of October, now overbought here in, uh, in early December, but breaking above the 200-day moving average for the first time since September. And if you're nervous about these kind of names, let's say you bought back here, you're feeling pretty good, but you're nervous about giving up those gains. This is where a trend line off the lows can be a bit of a lifesaver um, because I was taught that all large losses begin as, as small losses. So when you're sitting on a position that actually has a lot of gains, the concern is always, do I, you know, I don't want to give them all back and hold it all the way back down. Uh, it's sort of the GameStop effect, right? Sort of those, those meme names that ran right, way up very quickly. Everyone feels like a genius. And then they go right back down and you lose all of it and more on the way back down. We want to avoid that. So on a chart that's actually in a pretty good uptrend, use trend lines off of the lows. And as long as we hold that trend line, it's not the only thing I would look at, but it's just a good kind of peace of mind type of indicator, just reminding you that the trend is still positive. So I think trend lines on some of these uh, charts like Delta, like Southwest, they're having pretty, pretty good runs off the lows. Those are some of the things I might look at uh, to, uh, to, to manage uh, potential downside risk. Finally, I have to highlight some big moves in the consumer staples sector. Um, I won't tell you which one, but one of us, Grayson or I, for Friday's uh, special edition of the Final Bar, one of us did indeed pick a consumer staple stock. You'll have to tune in to see what it was, but it was not Campbell's Soup, but CPB, some of the other food products names, actually having a nice move to the upside. Uh, CPB up 7% today. So let's look and see if consumer staples, a lagging sector, becomes a bit of a leader here in December. That's it for our market recap. I want to move on to today's guest, John Kosar, here in a moment. Before we do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, we would love to hear from you. We've had a lot of fun with some live Q&As. We always have the mailbag open, and it's such a pleasure to hear from you guys. Appreciate your kind words about the show, feedback on your host, on our guests, and all of that, but especially the questions that are coming up as you are trying to use technical analysis to make better decisions. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. On X, just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. Make sure you follow us there. And also on our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe to the channel while you're here. Make sure you like this video while you're watching and uh, drop a comment below the video if you have any questions that come up along the way. We'll look to uh, go into that mailbag here very soon. We'll hope, probably do a couple uh, mailbag episodes here uh, in December to answer some of those questions that we've uh, come in. Next thing to let you know about, I'll be doing a webinar next Tuesday. Uh, which is uh, December 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern, called 10 Questions Every Investor Should Ask. And it's really intended to be at year end. I love to think about the end of December, beginning of January, uh, as a time to look back, a time for reflection, for renewal, uh, for all, for rest and relaxation, but especially to think about your journey as an investor. What did you learn in the year that just happened? What are you hoping to do in the year to come? I'll share with you the 10 questions that I ask at the end of every year, I will answer them uh, during the webcast and go through the 10, explain what they are, and I would encourage you to follow along, uh, you know, hopefully learn from some of my own experiences, my own mistakes over the course of the year, but I will also allow you to answer the questions yourself, and that is where the growth can really happen. So if you want to have a good 2024, make sure you spend time reviewing what happened in 2023. To sign up for that free event, go to marketmisbehavior.com slash 10 questions. 
and I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday the 12th. Also, the Stock Traders Almanac is on sale on the Stock Charts bookstore. We had Jeff Hirsch of the Stock Traders Almanac on our show last week. Great conversation about seasonal tendencies in 2023. Looking forward to the election year of, uh, of 2024. You need to use the code ALMANAC30 when you check out, and uh, you'll save 30% off the uh, listed price. Those are actually going out here, uh, I think, at the end of this week. Uh, so uh, we're ready to ship those out for you. Make sure you go in there today and get that offer on our uh, special uh, sale for the Stock Traders Almanac for 2024. I want to welcome on today's guest, John Kosar. John is the founder of Asbury Research, coming to us live from Chicago, Illinois. He's been a frequent guest on the, uh, on the show. Someone I think of as a mentor. He's just a really thoughtful analyst and really applies the technical toolkit in a way that I wish others could emulate. John, good to see you again. How have you been? I've been good. The markets have been quite interesting, and I have a feeling they're going to get even more so between now and the end of the year. I feel like every time you come on, something significant has happened. I mean, just the world has changed so much in the last couple of months. You were last on, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I think in, uh, in, in October. We talked about the market conditions, talked about what we were seeing on the way down. I think a lot of changes now as we've uh, rotated back to, uh, to the upside. Your first chart is setting the stage with the S&P 500. When you look at the conditions here in early December, what do you take away from the chart here? Well, um couple of things. Um, I was on right around <clears throat> just before I was on, on the 18th mm -hmm. and um, 4,200 was an obvious support level that everybody was talking about. And we held there and we broke the nice downtrend line from the July high. We actually gapped above it. That was a perfect, that's going to end up in somebody's technical analysis <laughs> book one day. Uh, but then we ran into this really important resistance. 4607 is that high from back in July. And just above there at 4637, mm -hmm. that's the May high of 2022. So those big formidable levels don't get broken very often without some kind of a pullback first. And you had mentioned that there's resistance all over the place. You see it in the SOX index, the semis, they mm -hmm. usually leave. You see it in the NASDAQs, they usually lead. So there's like a wall of resistance. You see it in NVIDIA, uh, you see it in Amazon, it's everywhere. So what I'm looking at now is the last resistance level that we broke on September 1st was 4541. The reason that I turned it green is now it's support. And you can see that the market's been, ranges have been shrinking it's gone from the Wild West, right, back at the end of October to everything is kind of shrinking down. And that's because the market doesn't know what to do here. The market recognizes that it's an important level. So everyone's pulling in their horns. They don't want to get too far out over their skis. If we break down through 4541, that's going to be the first price-based indication that the market may be starting to roll over. Really interesting chart. I, you, I love how you describe that as sort of an indecision. And that, that's what it's felt like, right? I mean, you had an incredible rally there in, in most of November, but then the last couple of weeks kind of stabilized in there. So 4541 sounds like a key level you, you would watch there. What's your confidence level that that level holds through the end of the year here? Um, is there anything lower than zero? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Point taken. So uh, very, very low confidence. We'll call that one then, uh, then John. When when well, we're uh, we closed, yeah. So we closed at forty five, forty nine. So we're right there. Yeah, right. I was going to say just today we're coming down very quickly to that level, right? Um, looking at your Asbury six, I know the last time we talked, we were talking about the conditions. You know, September, October really starting to deteriorate. It seems like there's been quite a switch in your market model here. Talk to us about the Asbury six and where it sits today. Well, when I was with you last, <clears throat> the Asper 6 was 3 and 3. And yeah. that indicates the market's in balance, or it means the market could be shifting. It was 3 and 3 from being all red or all negative for a month or more. So that was kind of this balance point. We're right around 4,200. Mm. <clears throat> and I talked about the VIX. If the VIX got back underneath 1750, that was a trigger for me. Uh, that happened, I think, at the end of October. And the Esbury 6 went back to four or more being green on November the 2nd. Um, and it's been mostly green since then. Uh, S&P's risen by 10% into the highs. And now you see the first little crack in the armor here. We had the rate of change 
roll over into negative territory as of the close yesterday. I haven't done this yet for today, but yesterday when we were updating the SBR6, we noticed that there was a couple other of these metrics that were vulnerable on weakness to roll over. So we could very well have three red going into tomorrow. We could have four. If we go to four red, that to me is that's time to ring the cash register on those longs that you may have put on in the beginning of November. And especially if 4541 is broken. And then there's one other chart here that um, I am looking at that I didn't put here, um, but 1275 in the VIX, if you go back four or five months, that was the lowest that the VIX got. And those were all minor peaks in the S&P 500. Um, if the VIX rises above 1360 between now and the end of the week, that's another trigger for me. Yeah, you can see those right there. Yeah. So if we get through 1360 in the VIX, that's our number. If we rise up above there, that addition to the Asbury 6 would be another trigger that it's time to pull back your horns and your equity exposure. Yeah, it's it's so interesting how low the VIX has remained I, for much of the last you know six seven months. But I think I think you're absolutely right. A, a quick spike in the VIX tells you the conditions could be changing very very rapidly. That's a, that's a great point, yeah. John. Um, your last chart we're looking at um, money market funds, the Ridex uh, money market funds. Can you explain this chart? What it tells you about the conditions maybe going uh, into the beginning of next year? Sure, this is a wonky chart. One of my hedge fund clients, about ten. Sometimes you get your best ideas from your clients, right? So sure. Some hedge fund that I was working with, um, you know, through Asbury Research said, have you ever looked at money market flows? And I was like, well, no, I really haven't. I started to play around with the idea. And what this chart shows without getting into too much detail is these peaks in the lower panel are periods when there was a rush of money out of the money market, according to the Rydex Money Market Fund, which is RYMXX is the tick ticker. And what I showed here is when you get, so I built an indicator that measures the velocity of money moving in or out of this particular mutual fund, this fund, uh, Rymex. And these red lines show when you had the peak of that rush of money out. When there's money rushing out of the money market, it's logically because People don't want to be safe anymore. People are saying, hey, I missed a lot of this rally. I've been hiding in the money market. I'm missing all this move. It's time for me to get back in equities. And when that happens, just the way human nature is, oftentimes that's the top. And you'll see all of these little tactical tops that this picked off, August 9th, these two, Feb 9, uh, two of these in June, um, or June and July uh, 21st. And we're backing off of a similar test from right around Thanksgiving. That's another reason, a little bit more esoteric one, but that's another reason to believe that the market has reached some sen uh, exhaustion uh, of some kind. So all this stuff I could go on and on and show you more indicators, but the market's really vulnerable here. And we've been telling our clients for the past three or four days, trading days, if you've got some big winners, uh, if you're managing money and you have some big winners in your portfolio, start to pay yourself. Ring the cash register on some of that position because I think mm -hmm. this could be, th things could get dicey here between now and the end of the year. It's it's really interesting and I, I appreciate it. It's a great great uh, sort of contrary opinion uh, take on that, on that last chart, John. When you look forward, obviously uh, we have a Fed meeting next week. I mean, not expected to be any change of any sort in rates, but certainly a lot of people will be looking at the commentary when you go toward the beginning of next year, given the run that we've had, given the overextended feel that I think you, you established with the market, how do you position yourself going into the beginning of next year? Is there a safe haven of sorts that you feel is good to be in? Is it more important to just stick with what's working and make sure you manage your money effectively? How do you sort of coach people to get through this kind of period? That's a great question. What I've been watching closely, one of our models is called U.S. versus the world. And it looks at, at the S&P 500 versus 25 foreign equity markets in three different time periods. And what has bubbled up to the surface over the past three weeks is Western Europe has started to outperform. Hmm. You see it in Spain, you see it in France, you see it in uh, Italy. Uh, two others that I can't 
remember which ones they were, but Western Europe, and now you're seeing it from other places. You're seeing it in Mexico, you're seeing it in Canada, but this Western European area has been of interest to me for the past few weeks. And um, the relative performance is what I'm looking at versus the S&P 500. So we've been telling clients uh, to start defensively moving some money into some of these areas. It's a place to hide if we go through a correction. The other thing I've been telling people to do is to shift into value has started to outperform. Mm. Um, so has the diamond. So has the Dow 30. I call the Dow 30 the boroughs and I call the NDX the racehorses, right? So when the market starts getting a little spooky and we're up against the resistance level, a lot of managers will shift their allocations over to the Dow. If you remember last year, during the major downtrend last year, the Dow, uh, the Dow 30 did quite well versus the S&P 500. Mm. So for those who need to be in the market because they're managing money, that's another good place to hide. It's so interesting, the run that we've seen in some of the names that are more down names that I would think than others, financials, other sectors like that. With something, I mean, I'd love to just ask you, with something like the, uh, the XLF, I mean, this is a sector that I feel like so many people have ignored for quite some time. I mean, given the rate environment, sort of no one's looking there. Do you see a move like this and are you encouraged at fin for financials going forward? Or is this another one of those too far, too quickly, and let's just be patient? How do you interpret the move in some of the larger banks here? Well, I talked to you at various times about our CEIF model, CEIF is hmm. sector ETF asset flows. CEIF started showing us signs that there was money moving into financials two weeks ago. So, and so we're actually, um, CEIF is actually overweight financials now. Right. Um, the banks have really taken off. Uh, yeah. The regional banks have been just crazy here for the last week. The way that I look at markets is, I'm not smart enough to figure out why something happens. I'm trying to watch money moving around the board. So we've started mm -hmm. seeing money moving into financials pretty aggressively um, over the past two or three weeks. So that actually flipped our model to overweight financials. As long as that money keeps going in there, I'm there too. If I see that money start to filter away from there and move into another area, we just move with the money. Mm, when in doubt, follow the money. John, this has been a pleasure as always. Good to have you on. Thanks for being a guest a number of times this year. It's been fun to be along with you and riding through this year. I hope we can do it again uh, next year, but between now and then, have a great holiday season, okay? Happy holidays to everyone. It's always fun to be on here with you, Dave. Thanks, John. That's John That's, uh, John Kosar. John's the uh, founder, chief market strategist at Asbury Research, coming to us from Chicago. It's, it's really helpful with someone like John, the Asbury 6 model. I'm a big fan of that, a tactical model, looking at not just technical things, but a number of different things. John does a great job of focusing on flows and sentiment, and he mentioned at the end, following the money. Interesting to see how quickly that model has now rotated. And just one initial red uh, item on there, as I'm seeing, I'm wondering if we'll uh, continue to see a little bit uh, further. So I look forward to checking back in with John in the new year. That's John Kose, our founder of Asbury Research. Folks, we've got to wrap the show and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. In our market recap, I showed the S&P 500, the daily chart. We focused in a little bit on the, um, uh, what we call the, the candle chart, right? The, the bearish engulfing pattern. Up day yesterday, down day today. Today's range engulfs the previous range. I just wanted to show you a five-day uh, intraday chart of the S&P, just so you can see what is happening during the day to make that candle pattern, right? So here's yesterday's session. So here's last Friday with the big run, finishing the week in a position of strength. Monday, we opened a little bit lower. This is the SPY we're looking at, by the way. Kind of chopping around, but finishing at the upper end of the session. Here's yesterday, an initial move higher, but the rest of the day kind of settling into that range. Here's today. So we open up, we gap up to Friday's close. And so it felt early on as in, oh man, this might be a lights out, strong finish uh, to, uh, to Wednesday's session. But through the course of the day, just a lot of distribution. And when you see those two bar candle patterns, this is what I want you to think about in your brain, about the, uh, what the two-day uh, experience actually means. This is why that bearish engulfing pattern is interpreted as a negative signal, because you gap higher, but look how no buyers came in, right? It's all selling through the course of the day today. That suggests short-term sentiment a little weaker than it's been. That suggests to me we may finish the rest of this week in a position of weakness and, again, continuing to come out of those overbought regions, come out of those extreme breadth readings. Chart number two is the airline index. We're using dollar sign XAL. This is one of the 
um, uh, 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 industry indexes. I think these come from the uh, Philadelphia Exchange, if I remember right, uh, the old uh, Philadelphia Exchange indexes. But dollar sign XAL, best way to just track the airline prices overall. When I was scanning for stocks, making new swing highs, a bunch of the airlines in there, right? Delta, United, uh, um, Southwest, all in the top 10 list for S&P 500 stocks uh, today. The run has been impressive, and this chart looks a lot like the chart of uh, random banks, of uh, Home Depot, a number of other stocks that had been in a downtrend through late October and now have just reversed and pushed back to the upside. I'm interested to see the airline index back above the 200-day moving average, overbought along with so many other things. The question I would have, or I think the, the, the challenge for these stocks that have had this run, what's the pullback look like? Can we establish a new foothold, a new higher low, that new level of support we can start to watch? Now it's sort of chasing a, uh, a run to the upside. Let's le- wait to see what that pullback looks like. This is the group that's really starting to outperform. Airlines, again, one of the worst groups in July through uh, uh, October, uh, now really changing course. Finally, Assurance, AIZ, I want to highlight that just, again, given all the uncertainty, given all the question marks, given all the different charts we look at, there are still charts out there that are just these steady gainers. I'm highlighting Assurance today, AIZ. This is a name we've highlighted before, just a nice uptrend off of a low in March and just continue to push higher. Higher highs, higher lows, a couple of consolidation periods like this uh, coil pattern in May, June, July, resolving to the upside above two upward sloping moving averages in general, owning names that are making higher highs and higher lows above moving average support. Those are the types of name I tend to be pretty happy to have in my portfolio. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to John Kosar of Asbury Research joining us for Chicago. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel while you're here, and uh, we'll see you on our next episode. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.